question is that this bill be now read a second time and the member for Tangney has the call. The truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. So said Winston Churchill. The Department of Defence has a problem with accepting the truth. Questioned in 2004 regarding the Joint Strike Fighter, Air Marshal Houston stated, the expectation is they will begin arriving in Australia by 2012. He went on to say, it is a conservative estimate, that is when we would expect. In 2005, he said, we're still planning on 2012. In 2007, he again stated, delivery would be in 2012 and the initial operational capability, or IOC, would be in 2014-2015. In 2009, Dr Gumley, head of DMO, Defence Material Organisation, said, the JSF is on schedule. I think the test program is running four or five months late. To reiterate, running on schedule. We have been talking about 2012 and initial aircraft in 2014 with IOC, well, initially 2013 IOC, and he said, this is not something I'll lose much sleep about. I do. And if Dr Gumley were, uh, and if I were Dr Gumley, he should have. Because ultimately, these aircraft aren't experiments in marketeering. Rather, they're tools for young men and women in uniform, and they will use it to defend this great nation from enemies with superior technologies. It is a question about lives, not maintaining the extravagant livelihoods of Lockheed Martin executives. Continuing, in 2011, Air Vice Marshal Osley told Parliament that the US JSF Program Manager, Vice Admiral Ven Lett, said the program is now funded on a great deal of realism. Air Vice Marshal Osley said, I think our estimate is now becoming a realistic estimate instead of a conservative estimate. Then the IOC was taken to be 2018, and he reiterated his confidence on this numerous times in testimony. But a few months ago, we were told that this had now slipped to 2020. And Bill Sweetman of Aviation Week and Sp uh, Space Technology, the Trade Bible, states that IOC in the US is only likely to be in 2020. Even if this doesn't slip, how would you like to order a 1991 VN Commodore and finally take delivery when the competition is producing the FG or current model Falcons? How competitive would that VN Commodore be? Should you stick with your VN Commodore? The Department of Defence seems to think so. On Defence's risk management matrix, a slip of merely 12 months is considered an extreme level of risk. Yet the program is now over half a decade late and there are no flags being thrown up. In 2005, Air Marshal Houston said, currently the indicators are that the flyaway costs for the F-35 will be about $45 million. In 2006, Air Commodore Harvey is talking about approximately $47 million on 2002 base year. We're getting them early, so Harvey said approximately $55 million average for our fleet. Then in 2008, Dr Gumley stated that he would be surprised if we paid more than about $75 million a copy for the aircraft, measured in 2008 dollars, assuming we buy at least 75 or three squadrons. I was told by Defence uh, in then Minister Nelson's office that the average unit procurement cost that was being worked on by Defence was $131 million per unit. So why did Dr Gumley say he would be surprised if we paid more than 75 million each? Defence deliberately talks costs that make up the price instead of the price so that they can obfuscate. Then Air Vice Marshal Harvey in 2010 was talking about the fleet was $75 million in 2008 dollars at a 0.92 exchange rate. The Government Accountability Office in the United States talking about average procurement cost of the JSF has gone up from $69 million in October 2001. In April 2010, it was up to $114 million each. In June 2010, after a nunn McCurdy breach, it was revised to $133 million per copy. Using the risk management matrix, a 10% increase in cost is severe. 
And a combination of severe and almost certain means that you will have a category of extreme level of risk. Once again, why no red flags? Air Power Australia is routinely denigrated by defence, which will obviously have a neg negative impact on the work that they get, as well as organisations such as Repsom. The reason they are denigrated is because they have the audacity to criticise the JSF program. Problematically for defence, they tend to be accurate, whereas defence woefully fails. Take cost. In 2006-07, Air Power Australia had an estimate of between 136 and 176 million, far more accurate than defence talking about significantly less than 100 million. Were they just deliberately misleading Parliament, given that they had admitted the 131 million average unit procurement cost to me in 2007? They tend to hide behind many definitions of cost, deliberately obfuscating failed projects by throwing various prices and costs out there. Air Vice Marshal Osley also boasted of no foreign customers having pulled out, and even boasted it of, of it not being beyond my level of expertise to comment on politics in Canada, before assuring us that it was just politics in Canada and Canada would stay in. In fact, Canada is pulled out of the program. The Danes have ordered advanced F-16s as a stopgap, which I'm told will likely become the final capability. In other words, they'll dump the JSF as well. The Dutch are prevaricating and the probability is that they will pull out. As I've said, there's been unfair criticism of APA by defence. As an example, Air Vice Marshal Osley stated of APA's criticisms of the F-35's aerodynamic performance that it was inconsistent with years of detailed analysis undertaken by defence, the JSF program office, Lockheed Martin and the eight other partner nations. He further stated that their analysis was basically flawed through incorrect assumptions and a lack of knowledge of classified F-35 performance uh, information. The Joint Operational Requirements Document, or JORD, had specifications on various measures of performance. For acceleration at 30,000 feet, the objective was 40 seconds or less, and the threshold, or bare minimum, was 55 seconds. We were told by defence that it would meet spec, and Tom Burbage, head of the JSF program with Lockheed Martin, misled Parliament in March last year by stating the airplane will continue to be well in excess of its basic requirement. The aircraft is meeting all other requirements today. He stated other because it failed to meet the range requirement of 590 nautical miles, and they have conveniently changed the definition of the requirement of the A model, which Defence recommends that we get, so that it could reach spec. In terms of that acceleration spec, the JSF program office in the US has asked the Joint Requirements Oversight Committee, or JROC, to relax the requirement to 63 seconds, which is similar to the performance of a 50-year-old F4 Phantom. So much for meeting spec. In 2006, APA calculated the A model would take over 60 seconds for acceleration, which is now proven correct. This is on record at the same time that Defence and Lockmart were telling us it was meeting or exceeding spec. Whose analysis is flawed now? Similarly for turn performance, the aircraft had an objective to sustain 6G at 15,000 feet with a bare minimum threshold of 5.3G. In 2006, APA calculated it could only sustain 4.7G at the same time Defence and Lockmart were assuring us it would meet spec. Once again, JPO has requested JROC to relax the spec to 4.6G. This is less than said 50-year-old F4 Phantom, which was known as a truck for its turn performance at the time whose analysis is flawed now. So much for the years of detailed analysis undertaken by Defence, the Joint Program of uh, JSF Program Office, Lockheed Martin, and eight other partner nations. This aircraft has had very austere specifications placed on it in the Jord, and Lockmart has just designed the aircraft to meet not the objectives, 
which are not much of a stretch anyway, but the bare minimum threshold specs and have failed to even meet them. They have a weight problem with the aircraft, and military aircraft always put on weight. This aircraft is only 270 pounds under the maximum allowable empty weight according to the Director of Operational Test and Evaluation. They have even gone so far as removing fuel stop valves and extinguishers in the dry bays, which according to dot and &E, increases the aircraft's vulnerability to ground fire by 25% compared with legacy aircraft. But this program is based on magic, because in terms of the fundamentals of air, air combat, this aircraft is a comprehensive and hugely expensive failure. But it is a trillion dollar program over its life. So no wonder we're getting so much spin and so little substance. By every measure, the aircraft is an outlier. We're told this aircraft will let the missiles do the work. No need for aerodyna high aerodynamic performance. It will all occur at beyond visual range. So why do they crow about a 50 degree angle of attack capability, which is only important in close combat? The reason is that according to Defence and Lockmart, the JSF is the answer. And therefore anything it can do is important and great. But what it cannot do is irrelevant. They're quite willing to mislead, lie, obfuscate, anything to ensure the continuation of this white elephant. Remember, even if it achieves the 2020 IOC, this turkey will be in service until 2060 odd. And do you really think it will be remotely competitive then? Why are the Russians, the Chinese, the Europeans, and indeed Lockmart with its other fighter, the F-22, spending so much money for these aircraft to have super maneuverability and super cruise, or the ability to cruise supersonically without using afterburner, if it is not important? Indeed, the JSF will have to light up the sky to get into a position to fight using a lot of uh, fuel hungry and very hot afterburners which can see, be seen from a long distance away just to get to the speed required to do that. Does the JSF program really have the ultimate and only correct view of air combat? A view that be, uh, bets against the fundamentals of air combat that have been shown to be fundamental to air combat time and again over the last century despite having been bet, uh, have people having bet against so, said fundamentals on numerous occasions. Are those who designed the J-20, J-31, F-22, Eurofighter, Gripen and Rafale all wrong? And the fundamentals of air combat and the wisdom of the likes of John Boyd and von Clausewitz all wrong? And only the mighty Lockheed Martin Fort Worth division correct? I want Tom Burbage, the head of the JSF program with Lockheed Martin, to come to Parliament and explain why he didn't give false and or misleading information to this parliament. If we do not insist on full transparency, our fighting men and women will be the ones to pay the price, not those in Russell offices or the boardrooms of Lockheed Martin. Finally, no doubt, Defence and Lockmart will state that the magic is classified, hidden, and we will have to take them on trust that it truly is revolutionary, and it will change the nature of air combat, and that is why it is a world beater. The problem is, on all unclassified measures where we have had the opportunity to compare with what they have assured us is correct with the facts, they have been shown to be wrong. Furthermore, when independent experts have been demonstrated to be correct on these measures, where Defence and Lockheed Martin have failed so dismally, when they warn us that the JSF is uncompetitive, I believe we should take extremely seriously what they have to say and demand evidence from Defence and Lockmart. We should demand that they show us, not simply assure us. In the final analysis, facts are stubborn things. And I am more stubborn still.